Hi everyone, in this DIY experiment, we'll show you how to make water electrolysis, also called HHO generator. But first, let's go over some basic safety rules. Always wear protective goggles, gloves, and hearing protection for noisy detonations. First, we'll produce a continuous flame using our electrolyzer, then we'll show you how to make explosive foam, and, last but not least, we'll explain how it works and how it's made. Using energy from electricity, the electrolysis of water breaks the H2O molecule to generate dihydrogen H2 and dioxygen O2. We make run the system for one second and collect the large amount of energy stored in the gases. We made a tip which allows us to directly burn the gases. The flame is small, but hotter than a natural gas flame. It's more than 2500 degrees, enough to melt almost any metal. Let's make a comparison. A lighter flame barely reddens the spring, while it's turned to liquid when exposed to a hydrogen flame. The contact between the flame and the metal is weak, but the flame is so hot that after a while, the plastic around it melts. For this reason, we build a mini water cooler. We let the air to come in, and the water begins to flow. Now, instead of burning the gases as they are produced, we'll collect a small volume and release all the energy at once. Pure water is unconductive and can't be used to achieve water electrolysis. We simply add some sodium hydroxide, which is easy found in store, marked as liquid pipe and blocker. It contains HO ions, which allow the current to flow without wearing out the zinc plates. As we saw earlier, it works alright with the liquid and blocker, but the gel one contains additive that creates, with electrolysis, foam containing both gases. It's a good thing because the foam isn't volatile unlike the gas, so it can be used to store energy. In a few seconds, we already have a jar full of foam. And now, I'll release all the energy contained in the foam. I'll take a small quantity and... I'll ignite it to create an explosion. Things are getting serious. Now, for a new challenge, we'll fill this box with explosive foam. We let the electrolyzer run, powering it with an Xbox power core capable of delivering 16 amps in 12 volts, making it perfect to achieve a powerful electrolysis. Here is a little trick to measure the current without damaging the multimeter. We built a resistor of exactly 0 0.01 ohm. According to Ohm's law, when one amp crosses the resistor, there is exactly 0 0.01 volts at its bound. Here, we can see that the current is between 9 and 10 amps. It's filling up. This will probably hurt. To ignite this huge amount of foam safely, we improvise an electronic ignition device. In simpler words, we charge capacitors for a few seconds and then release all the energy in a fraction of a second. To short circuit the capacitors at the tip of this wire, we use a third wire that can generate a high voltage spark. It will ionize the air locally, the air will become conductive, and it will allow the strong current from the capacitors to flow. 
It even works underwater. I think 5 liters of foam is enough. The system is ready. Just one final check. Okay. It's now time to show you how the electrolyzer works. Like we mentioned earlier, we use sodium hydroxide, a basic compound, to make the water conductive. Never use salt, it damages the electrodes and release chlorine, which is toxic. With electrolysis, only the current, the number of amps, is proportional to the production of gas. That's why we need a power supply capable of delivering a strong current. And what about the voltage? Well, in theory, we need 1.23 volts at the bones of each cell for the chemical reaction to start. That's why we can arrange several electrolyzers in series with 12 volts. In our case, each one gets 3 volts. It's more than 1.23 because we need an over voltage in each cell for the high current to flow. For the current to be high with 3 volts only, each cell needs to have a weak internal resistance. That's why we use several zinc plates they need to be as close to one another as possible, without touching each other. What happens at the atomic scale? To simplify, picture each cell containing only two zinc plates. A chemical reaction takes place around each of those plates. According to convention, electrical current move from positive to negative, but the electrons move from negative to positive. The plate on the negative side receives electrons, the water reacts with those electrons, generating dihydrogen and another compound. Around the plate on the positive side, the water turns into dioxygen and another compound and releases electrons. The first reaction uses up two electrons, while the second one releases four. For the sake of coherence, the first reaction needs to take place two times faster than the second one. That's why we produce two times more dihydrogen than dioxygen. This is the exact proportion needed for both to burn simultaneously. In the end, both compounds we have here can react together to create water, making this simple final reaction. Each time this reaction takes place, the equivalent of four electrons move from the negative side to the positive one. Each electron carries a very weak charge, but when one mole of electron has flowed, a charge of one Faraday has been consumed. Combining this data, we can calculate that our electrolyzer generates up to 3 ml of gas per second. For everyone wishing to build this electrolyzer, here is how we did. As we said in the beginning of the video, be safe. Don't attempt to conduct these experiments if you have never built stuff or if you haven't knowledge in electricity. As usual, we only use recycled materials, except for the sodium hydroxide. You will need a power supply, as powerful as possible in low voltage, glass jars with airtight lids, metal plates, we recovered zinc plates from old computer, some glue, pipes, electric wires, tape, and sodium hydroxide. First, you need to cut some identical metal plates. The more plates there are in each cell, the better is the conductivity. Cut a nick on the side of each plate. Next, you need to cut plastic pieces in order for the plate to be close to one another without touching each other. Place alternatively the nick on the left and the right side. Put tape on the edges so that it holds well. To be sure, put some hot glue. Place a wire linking all the left nicks and the right ones. That will invert the polarity between each plate. We can now use both sides for most of them. Next, drill two holes in leads, one to let the wires out and one for the gas output pipe. Don't forget to glue the lead to the jar. You must build a bubble flashback arrestor where the gas production of each cell meets. If ever the gas were to burn in the outlet, the explosion wouldn't be able to reach the electrolyzers. This way, they are all protected. Fill each cell with tap water and slowly add sodium hydroxide until you reach the maximum current of your power supply. If you only want to make explosive foam, that's it.
Now, if you wish to obtain a direct flame while burning both gases, listen up. First, you need to build another bubble flashback arrestor using a narrow container so that the gas volume is the weakest possible. At every flashback, the explosion will be small. Next, use a long, narrow metal steam so that the heat of the flame doesn't melt the plastic or the glue. You now need to place a filter just before the flame. We personally use a vacuum cleaner filter, but you can very well use a piece of fabric. This step is crucial because the filter regulates the pressure, which isn't constant because of bubbles, and helps to avoid the systematic flashback each time the flame is lighted up or put off. It's also for this reason that the filter will quickly become damaged and you'll need to change it very, very often. You'll need to find an extremely narrow tip. We use a tip used to inflate bolts. The diameter of the hole is less than 1 mm wide. Despite being so small, this part is very important. It stabilizes the flame because the gas moves so fast in the opening that the flame can't go back inside. 